Hi, I'm Simon Salomon. I'm a professor in the Department of Mathematics at King's College London. I'm a, a member of the geometry group there. And today I'd like to introduce King's College, the Department of Mathematics and the programmes that we teach. Let me first tell you about some of the striking discoveries that have taken place at King's since its foundation. So the mathematics department is part of the Faculty of Natural and Mathematical Sciences, and we've had many famous scientists do work there. In particular, James Clerk Maxwell, the Scottish mathematical physicist, worked at King's from about 1860 to 1865. And it was at King's that he wrote down his celebrated equations for electromagnetism. These unify electricity and magnetism, which before were thought of as two completely separate entities. And it's hard to conceive of all the rapid developments that took place in physics at the start of the 20th century without Maxwell's equations. And I mention these later on as well. But if we pass on by almost 100 years, King's had a very active biophysics group. And it was the photograph that Rosalind Franklin took there that led to the structure of DNA being discovered, the double, the double helix structure that Crick and Watson discovered. Rosalind Franklin then went on to study viruses before her premature death. Peter Higgs obtained his PhD later in that decade at King's College London. Of course, he's now known for the Higgs boson. And coming back to waves, because it was Maxwell whose work led to the realisation of radio waves, but there's also the concept of gravitational waves that was discovered fairly recently. And the theory behind gravitational waves was worked out in the mathematics department in the, in the 1960s by people like Herman Bondi and Felix Pirani. So physically speaking, King's College London is at the very heart of London. It's very close to the river, in, in particular Waterloo Bridge. I'm talking about the campus where the Maths Department is. And it's very near the Law Courts, Covent Garden, and therefore because of the bridge, South Bank and so on. Although we do have other campuses spread around London, there's one near London Bridge, the Guy's campus just underneath the Shard, and other campuses also linked to hospitals. Now, of course, at the time of speaking, not all our students are in London. Some are and are coming in for classes. Others are studying remotely. We hope, of course, in a year's time, all if not almost all, if not all of our students will be based in London, but in any case, we're adapting our techniques to cover all eventualities. So assuming you can work in London, of course, you have excellent facilities for both study and leisure. We have a fantastic library also five minutes walk away from our main campus. So let me say one or two other things before I move on to more technical aspects. The King's College London has a very strong student union, KCLSU. There are facilities to study abroad. Some programmes you can add a year and uh, study abroad. So for mathematics, this would typically be the penultimate year in which you can choose to study at a number of partner universities abroad several in the United States and some in Asia, for example. King's College can help you organise internships with firms in London. Of course, there are tremendous opportunities uh, to work with firms in London. And there are some research opportunities. You can also do modern language modules as an extra or instead of a scientific module, for example, in your third year. Also modules from other departments, help with careers, lots of advice to help get a job afterwards.
So the first obvious question to ask is why would one want to study mathematics? Now you may have made your mind up to study maths and be completely committed to the subject or possibly you're juggling it with other possibilities, physics or maybe something rather different. Mathematics is a highly regarded subject, degree subject in this country. You can do many different careers with a degree in mathematics. You don't have to use the mathematics you studied because studying the mathematics is a sort of proof that you can think logically, organize your thoughts and help in all sorts of contexts that are helpful in industry, in many other jobs, in health or in many, many jobs. It's also closely related to data science, which you may choose to study in more depth before finding a job. So there was a highly cited report written by Deloitte a few years ago, explaining the huge impact and importance of mathematics to the UK economy. People trained in mathematics, the value they add to the UK economy. So as is written here, maths is one of the most versatile degrees you can get. Even within the degree, you can decide to do different study different parts of the subject in your third year. And whether you go on to study more maths or go and get a job immediately, there are many prospects available. Of course, I could explain myself that I'd simply enjoy doing mathematics, but it's also becoming really essential to understand many phenomena in everyday life not to mention its huge importance in physics and now in biology as well. So the next question is, why would one choose King's College London for mathematics? Well, as I've explained earlier, uh, we have an established faculty and also established mathematics department with a lot of fundamental work that has already taken place there. All our teachers, all our lecturers and professors, we all work internationally. We do research internationally and we're recognized for that. In fact, two of our staff are also fellows of the Royal Society. Uh, because of our high quality research, we were actually ranked fourth in the UK for, our, for the world leading quality of our research. Uh, we have very strong links with other maths departments in London and indeed some students take modules in their third year in other departments but many of us work with colleagues in other universities in the UK. Uh, a very special feature of King's if you're interested in finance is that we have links with the financial institutions which are just uh, a few yards or up to a mile away from us. We're very close to the city of London. And another characteristic of our department is that we have a theoretical physics group. So we have a lot of courses, for example, in theoretical physics, which are very mathematical, and uh, that, that some students find that very interesting. Uh, we indeed, in the third year, you, you can do mainly theoretical physics type courses if you want to, or there are many other choices. How are we running our teaching? Well, of course, at the moment it's a little special, but the principles are the same, that we have lectures, we have skill sessions with qualified tutors and lecturers, and we have smaller tutorial classes. One can have one-to-one -one contact with lecturers, and we also have very good facilities, computer facilities for certain that are useful for certain courses or just for helping students carry out their work. In terms of student led activities, we have a very dynamic student society in mathematics. And they actually also organize their own courses for things like computing, Python, computing language, Mathematica, another computing software language, and LaTeX, which is used almost universally by mathematicians for typesetting. 
So courses on that are available as a sort of extra, but most students take them, one or more of them. Uh, of course, they're on frequent social events. At the moment, those are online. Um, but we were lucky last year that, that there's also an annual retreat and this took place in 2020. In February, about a week before the UK's lockdown, we, we all went to, some of us went to Windsor, Windsor Great Park and we spent a weekend discussing, discussing things a bit outside the usual curriculum. Now I'm coming to the meat of this talk. So what do we offer in terms of degrees? Well, our standard mathematics degrees are the BSc and the MSci. The BSc, the bachelor's degree is a three year degree and the MSI is a four year degree. You can apply for either, but you're not committed. You can apply, for example, for the three year degree. And then if you decide you want to do the four year degree, you have at least two years to make that choice. So you can switch from the BSc to the MSI and you can also switch backwards. We also have a mathematics with statistics three-year degree, bachelor's degree. What does it mean mathematics with statistics? Well, it means that you, to begin with, you do about three quarters math mathematics and a quarter statistics in some form, statistics, probability, and so on. But you can specialize in the second and third years and do increasingly more statistics related modules. Although I should say that even if you do the straight mathematics degree, you have access to some of these statistics modules, although you're not forced to do them. You can choose to do more pure mathematics, for example, if you want. Uh, we also run jointly with the mathematics, with the philosophy department. We run the mathematics and philosophy. This is a, this leads to a three year BSc degree. And the that's an and maths and philosophy in the sense it really is sort of half and half. Half the modules will be done in the maths department, half in the philosophy department, although later on in the course, for example, in the third year, you can do either almost entirely maths or almost entirely philosophy if you want. And then for many years, we've run um, a degree called mathematics with management and finance. This is a three year degree. And again, it's mainly mathematical to begin with, but each semester one does one module uh, from the business school related to management. And then in the third year, there are, there are also mathematical finance options. So those are our degree courses. And now I'm going to go into some detail about the actual lecture courses, we call the modules that you take. So the, the basic idea is this, that each semester, and we have two teaching semesters, one runs until mid-December and the other one runs from mid-January to the end of March. In each semester, students typically take four modules, four lecture courses. In the first year, those eight, this is, so what, I'm, what we're seeing now are the courses for the straight mathematics degrees. As I say, if you're doing, say, maths with management and finance, one or two of these modules will be substituted by modules from the business school. But in year one for straight mathematics degrees, in the first semester, there's calculus one, introduction to algebra, linear algebra and geometry one, and sequences and series, which is itself an introduction to analysis. And then the ones I've left out are done in the second semester and more or less well, everyone has to do those modules. There's no choice in the first year if you're doing the straight maths degree. Then in the second year, it's rather more complicated. There are choices, uh, but you can see here a selection of the modules that are available. Uh, so, for example, you will do, or you can do, uh, probability statistics two, having done part one in the first year. And then there are optional modules like discrete mathematics, which I actually teach at the moment, geometry and surfaces, and so on. So that's the setup in years one 
and 2. So I labelled years 1 and 2 as foundation because a lot of the courses are necessary in order to study further in mathematics. Unlike other subjects, each course you do in maths tends to use something you've learned before, not always. So here are the, the, the much more expansive lists of options available in year three. This is for the three-year degree, or if you go on to do the four, fourth-year degree, you have many different options available. So I just want to point out that in year three, uh, you're still only going to do eight modules in the year, four in each semester. So you can see here you have much more choice. And in fact, you have a completely, for the straight mathematics BSc, you have a complete choice. There's no, no compulsory module. You can, if you choose, do a BSc uh, uh, three-year project, which counts as a module. But you don't have to do that. And there's a mixture, I would say, of modules in pure mathematics, for example, Galois theory, study of polynomials and symmetry in solving equations. There are modules in applied mathematics, like mathematical biology. And there are modules in theoretical physics, which is closer to apply, but also had aspects of pure mathematics to it. So space-time geometry and general relativity, for example. Then I'm not going to read out the modules in, in year four, but you can see that there's a vast list if you go on to do the four year, fourth year degree. Many of these modules actually uh, overlap with our master's degree, our one year master's degree. So in practice, the backbone of our teaching of each module is the online system called Moodle, or KCL's adaptation of it, which we call Keats. So each module, each lecture course, has a web page on Keats, call it a Keats page. And you can actually find samples of these pages uh, publicly available you just type the URL, which is near the top of this page, keats.kcl.ac.uk slash course. And you have to get, navigate a bit further to find the mathematics courses. And I'll mention this URL again. Uh, but you will find the various courses we give and material. You can, you can inspect the material on those pages to get a, uh, an idea of the modules. So I'm displaying you a bit of the module, the first semester, first year module, Linear Algebra and Geometry 1. And there's a video which I think you can also see without logging on. So all our teaching is, is highly organized and we have lots of material. Of course, that's particularly useful at the moment with many people studying remotely. Uh, and my feeling is that, that this situation will actually help all future generations because or universities will be much more highly organized in this sense. Now, I've been talking about the teaching, but as a member of staff at King's, a lot of my time is also devoted to research. As in all the top universities, uh, the majority of lecturers are also doing world-leading research. And our research, and this is important also for the teaching, because when you're doing research, you can actually refresh in your teaching and bring in ideas, current ideas from research and insert it into teaching. And this happens, for example, in our theoretical physics courses. They now talk about gravitational waves since this, these have been discovered and so forth. Our, we have seven research groups. Uh, three are essentially in pure maths. There's my own group, geometry. There's analysis, deals with function spaces and so on. And there's number theory, which is a sort of part of algebra, but it's really to some extent concerned with properties of prime numbers. That's simplification. But there's a lot of deep work done in number theory, very active area of research. On the applied side, we have disordered systems or complex systems that study many phenomena which uh, involve disorder in some sense. And financial maths, we have a group, large group in financial mathematics, 
with links to the city of London, but using some quite sophisticated techniques in mathematics, stochastic analysis, and so on to understand finance. And we have a big theoretical physics group, many of the members of which study string theory, for example. And we have a statistics group. Now, some of you may have read outside the sort of maths you're doing uh, at school, but the next three slides are really to impress on you that there are many differences between mathematics at school and mathematics at university. It's not just a matter of going straightforwardly ahead. So the way one works tends to be very different. Um, you have to organize your own work. And whereas at university, you, you, you think more and try and understand problems and find solutions yourself without necessarily being given model solutions. Uh, and as a result, it turns out that some people who perhaps uh, did not excel at school, but nevertheless gain a post at university, at a good university, can actually do much better at university. So it's not, it's not straightforward to predict performance. And conversely, some people who do very well at school may find at university that it's not so easy and, and they're no longer top of the class, although that's not always the case. You can be top at school and top at university, of course. So another feature of university mathematics is it's on the whole more abstract depending exactly what you did at school, I think you'll find, however, that it's more abstract. And that makes it harder. It makes, for many people, it makes it harder. Uh, so we study many, I mean, part of mathematics is always to generalize things that are very familiar. So here are a few examples. You can have infinite sums. You, you probably know some already, but you have infinite sums, which nevertheless, when you add them up, you just get a finite number. Of course, a famous example is one plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth and so on, sums of the reciprocal powers of two. Uh, not all functions have a derivative. You're probably used to sort of me giving you a function and you telling me it's derivative, but one can concoct functions which don't have a derivative actually at any point. Uh, we use algebraic systems in which x times y, we have some sort of multiplication, but x times y is not the same as y times x. If you know about square matrices, then they uh, do not obey the commutativity rule that xy is equal to yx. And then dimensions, which you might be used to thinking of dimensions 1, 2, 3, 3 for ordinary space. Uh, in mathematics, we have any number of dimensions. Uh, they don't even have to be integers because fractal sets are, in fact, sets is dimension to which you can assign a dimension, but it's typically not an integer. In theoretical physics, they regard time as a fourth dimension, but string theorists use other dimensions to attempt to understand fundamental physics. In fact, my own work, which is partly motivated from theoretical physics, um, I'm, I specialize in seven and eight dimensions, and that makes perfect sense mathematically. And if you do analysis, you'll be dealing with spaces of functions which are actually infinite dimensional, and that requires special tools. And the other key thing about university, well, about higher, let's say more advanced mathematics, is that Many fields of mathematics are interrelated. So you might think of pure and applied mathematics being completely separate. That's not the case. They inform each other. So there are some examples of this. My own field of geometry is used, in fact, was fundamental in general relativity. Einstein's theory used the, the theory that Riemann had introduced 50 or so years earlier. And Geometry is also now increasingly important in quantum theory. Quantum theory is used in finance, concepts from quantum theory. And there are close links between number theory, which I mentioned earlier, and probability and analysis. And conversely, number theory is now essential in cryptography and web security, for example.
So I'm coming to the end of this uh, introductory talk, and I don't want to bore you with a lesson in mathematics, but I, I did want to say a little bit more about Maxwell. So this plaque is in one of our main corridors, and it gives you a bit of history, uh, explains the importance of Maxwell's equations, and it actually writes down the four equations. So here are the four equations written down. And they involve quantities like capital E, which is the electric field, capital B, which is the magnetic field, and other fields, all inter interrelated um, with a couple of partial differential equations involving time. So the quantities E and B, for example, in Maxwell's theory are example of fields. So the word field in mathematics, uh, even within mathematics, it has two completely different meanings. So if you talk to a, a, a physicist or in our department, a theoretical physicist, uh, they'll tell you that a field is something like a quantity that has a value at every point in space and time. And there are many different types of fields. It could be represented by uh, a single function, so-called scalar function, or it could be a vector field, uh, as the quantities in Maxwell's equations, or some of them. Or it could be a much more complicated object in mathematics called a tensor, which sort of generalizes a, a matrix. Uh, coming more up to date in physics, we have a subject called quantum field theory, which you can certainly learn about at King's. And it combines these fields in the classical sense with the theory of special relativity and quantum mechanics and gives rise to modern theory of physics, which is used, for example, to understand the behavior of particles, elementary particles. So that's a field in the sense of physics. But if you talk to someone in algebra, in number theory, for example, a field is a system of numbers, a system of numbers which generalizes the, the set of real numbers you'll be very familiar with, or the set of rational numbers, which are just ones, real numbers that in, can be expressed as fractions, or more precisely can be expressed in the form P over Q, where P and Q are integers and Q, of course, is not zero. And there's also the set of complex numbers. These are all examples of fields you can you can add, subtract elements, you can multiply them, and you can divide by something that's not zero. It's the division property that's important to have what's called a field rather than a more general ring. Uh, and there are also finite fields, the simplest of which just has two elements, zero and one. But since you must have addition, the only way out is to say that 1 plus 1 is equal to 0. That's addition modulo 2, as we say. Uh, and in fact, any finite field, you can't have a finite field of any size. The size of a finite field has to be p to the power k, where p is a prime number. So just a simple illustration of, of two fundamental concepts happen to have, unfortunately, the same name, but, but one is in physics, theoretical physics and one is in pure mathematics. So I'm at the end of my talk now. I just want to remind you that you can access our current teaching materials by going onto this website that's typed near the top of the page. Once you're there, you still have to do a bit of work to find the lecture courses in mathematics. So what you do is, first of all, you click on Faculty of Natural and Mathematical Sciences. Then assuming you're primary interest is mathematics, you click on mathematics. To see our current courses, you click on 2021, because we don't, of course, have material yet for next academic year. And in order to get a complete list of courses, you'll see some already, but to get the complete list, you should click top right on the item that says expand all. And that will show you what we're doing at the moment. Of course, we, a lot of our teaching is remote at the moment for, for some students. Uh, but the same principles will apply uh, for the following academic year in terms of the material. What we're teaching is essentially the same material and the same lecture courses. OK, so I hope this talk has been useful. 
there are many ways uh, today and in the future to get your questions answered. And I look forward maybe to meeting some of you in the future. Thank you.